We'd like to give you an opportunity to worship God this morning with your finances by giving back a portion of what God has entrusted to you. Tithing is an act of worship, and as followers of Jesus, tithing is an act of worship that we are called to do. Tithes allow us, as a church, to reach out and connect people to Jesus. So to give this morning, you can go and visit thegatheringottawa.com slash giving. Thank you for giving. Hello everyone, welcome to The Gathering Online. We exist to connect people to the love of Jesus, and we're glad you are a part of our online church family. I want to give you an opportunity for a form of worship, which is to worship with your finances whilst partaking in the act of giving. God has been so generous with us, and we want to be generous in turn. Tithing to the gathering funds all the things we do and ultimately connects people to the love of Jesus. So I'd like to invite you to prayerfully consider how you can give. You can visit thegatheringottawa.com slash giving to see information about giving online or via e-transfer or even about setting up direct withdrawal. Now that said, when we think about being generous, I don't want you to think only about us here at The Gathering, but I'd like to encourage you to think about some of the other ministries in our city that we partner with as well. It's the end of the year. If you're planning out your year-end giving, I'd love to give you some suggestions. Jericho Road. Jericho Road is a great organization here in Ottawa for men experiencing addiction. With peer mentoring, staff with lived experience, recovery meetings, and community engagement, Jericho Road builds a community of inclusion and they are wonderful. First Place Options. First Place Options is another great local organization. They provide free, non-judgmental, compassionate support and information on all pregnancy options for anyone facing an unplanned pregnancy. Another suggestion I'll give you is OIM, which stands for Ottawa Inner City Ministries. OIM is dedicated to promoting change in the areas of poverty, homelessness and social justice here in Ottawa. Really practically, they are looking for coats and sleeping bags and winter street survival kits, which are so needed as the temperature drops and there are so many people living on the street. So consider looking into them as well. Lastly, Compassion Canada. We heard from Jeff Hackett from Compassion last week. There was opportunity to sponsor a child or if you already have six or eight children, then you could choose to make a one-time donation in support of moms and babies in poverty. There you have it. If you were looking for an organization to bless with your year-end giving, those are four great ones, five if you include us. Because by the way, if we're going to meet our budget by the end of December, we're going to need God's people to be generous, which we believe they will be. So prayerfully consider what you can do, maybe over and above what you normally would tithe, if that's something you feel God nudging you to do. <clears throat> Excuse me, the voice is still coming back. Okay, moving on. Next weekend is an exciting weekend for many reasons, one of which is that I'm getting married. And the other is that we're having our annual family Christmas service. We love and value kids here at the gathering and we want to show them how valuable we think they are. So we give them the stage for a bit. It's always a blast. And it's the time that y'all need to invite the aunts and uncles and grandparents and friends out so that they can all see the kids shine too. The catch of course, is that this is only happening in person. So plan to join us at church next week if you can. And then you need to stick around because we're having a Christmas dinner potluck. Super great. Once you're in the business of going to church in person, then you need to plan to join us at the school at 4 p.m. on the 24th for Christmas Eve. We're having a candlelight service, which guys, is magical. So come and see that happen. Spend a really special time with your families at church and then go home and do your Christmas movie traditions or whatever it is that you do. But make the Christmas Eve service part of your tradition and invite the people in your life to the service as well. There are two times of the year when people who don't normally go to church decide to go to church, Easter and Christmas. So think of someone in your life that's just waiting to be invited to a Christmas Eve service and invite them, invite them to join you and your family at church this Christmas. It'll be a great service. Okay, back to the present. Today we have, we had, 
This morning we had an amazing service because it was Baptism Sunday. I have a handful of favorite services that happen throughout the year and baptism services are one of them. And the alleys came forward this morning and they took their steps of faith and it was wonderful. And since it was Baptism Sunday, Jeff had a special message from our God So Love the World Christmas series, which is coming at you right after I read some scripture. So today I will be reading 1 John 4 verses 9 to 10, which says, <clears throat> God showed us how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. <coughs> Father God, thank you for the amazing morning that we had this morning when we saw the alleys take that step of faith. Thank you for having a reason, for giving us a reason to take that step of faith. Thank you for sending your son. <clears throat> what a gift it is to be loved. Thank you for allowing us to be loved by you, for loving us first. We love you because you loved us first. Thank you, Jesus. I pray that right now, as Jeff comes onto the screen and speaks to our online church family, that you would just open up their hearts and prepare for whatever it is that, God, you have laid on Jeff's heart to share. I pray that those words would bless us, bless everyone that they are spoken to this morning. I pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Well, guys, <clears throat> I would invite you to consider joining us next week for these next couple of services that we've got coming up because you'll be glad you did. And also, I miss you. See you soon. We've got a lot of exciting things yet this morning, but before we do that, I do want to share a few things with you from God's word. This morning, we're in... Uh, the third week of our For God, or sorry, second week of our For God So Loved the World series. For God So Loved the World. We know John 3.16, very popular, probably the most popular Bible verse in the whole world. Not traditionally seen as a Christmas verse, but yet it, it encaptures, I think, uh, the entire Christmas message in just one verse. That because God so loved the world, he gave us Jesus. And so last week we focused in on God's love for the world, specifically by talking about the global poor. Compassion Canada was here with us, and we saw seven kids sponsored last Sunday, which is awesome. Seven kids. I know there are others who are thinking about sponsoring a kid or another kid, and some of you also made donations, as Christy talked about earlier, to some of their other projects, which is fantastic. But that's a, an amazing organi organization, Compassion Canada, that we're partnering with, and we can, uh, encourage you to consider what you could do this Christmas if you haven't already. But that's what we talked about last week, God's love for the world, specifically the global poor. This morning, we're focusing in on God's love, not just for the world, but specifically now for you and for me. A love that led Jesus to the cross, that led God, our creator, to send Jesus to this world, God in the flesh, to die on the cross for you and for me. So I want to share a few reflections with you this morning about God's love for you and for me, for us. Well, before we do that, I want to invite you to stand. We're going to actually read John 3.16 together. If you stand with me as our call to sermon, we can call it to worship. Maybe we'll call this a call to sermon. A very common passage of scripture, but let's just pray and read this passage together as a prayer. Okay? For God so loved the world, that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Fantastic. You can grab a seat. Now, I have a question I want to ask you as I start this morning. It's a really important question, maybe one of the most important questions that you could ever wrestle with. And I want to encourage you as I ask it to answer as honestly as you possibly can. But not theologically, necessarily, not just because you know what the Bible says or because you know what you should say or because you know what John 3.16 says, but I want you to an answer in as honest as a way as you possibly can, kind of just thinking about the very first thing that comes to mind. Okay, here's the question. It's what do you think God thinks about when God thinks about you? What do you think God thinks about when God thinks about you? Or more specifically, what do you think God feels towards you when God 
field thinks about you? Okay, that's the question. What do you think God thinks about when God thinks about you? Or how do you think he feels about you? Now, I want to... I want to encourage you now. We're just going to take a moment. I'm not going to have you shout stuff out at me because I want you to take some time to reflect on this. I want to encourage you to take out your phones and open your notes app or whatever you would use to take notes. And actually, let's take a moment just to respond quietly. You don't have to share this with anyone. I'm not going to ask you to shout it out. Just take a minute and write down some of the words that come to mind when you think of this very question. How do you think God feels about you. Just take a moment to respond to that. Lots of finger tapping, lots of thumbs clicking. Okay. Okay. Well, again, we won't go around the room and pick up answers. This could turn into a glorified therapy session pretty quickly. I don't think we, we necessarily want that to happen this morning, but I, I'm guessing that there were a variety of words that came up for us as we responded to that question. For some of us, I imagine that maybe you wrote down something like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what God thinks about me or how he feels towards me. Maybe you're newer to the faith conversation. You're exploring faith. You honestly don't know how to answer that question. It's awesome. Glad that you're here. Glad that you're thinking about that question. For others, you may have written down the word angry or anger. That you think when God thinks about you, that he, he thinks angrily towards you. That he feels anger you. Maybe because of how you were brought up, you grew up in the church, some of the messages that you heard about God, about how he's a wrathful God, angry. Maybe that's a word that comes to mind. Maybe a word that came to mind for you is the word disappointment. You think God's disappointed with you because of some of your life's decisions, because of some of your behaviors, because of maybe of some of your current struggles or doubts, things that are going on in your life. Or maybe you wrote down the word indifference or ambivalence or something like that. It's like, when God thinks about me, I, I don't think he really cares all that much. I'm not even sure he really knows I, I exist, quite frankly. You write down words like that, maybe, if you were being honest. For others of us, though, I, I imagine at least for those of us who are in a better place when it comes to our relationship with God, maybe you wrote down some more positive words, words like compassion. And you think of that Psalm, Psalm 103, about how the Lord is full of compassion and mercy, quick to forgive. And you're like, yeah, that's, that's what I think he thinks about when he thinks about me. His compassion towards me, empathy, mercy, grace. Maybe you wrote down the word blameless. Or holy, because you understand that when God looks at you, he doesn't just see you and your sin and your brokenness, but he actually sees Jesus, because Jesus took your place. And so he sees you now as being holy in right standing before him, even though you continue to sin and struggle and make mistakes and all that kind of stuff. Maybe you wrote down that word in, a, in an honest kind of way. Or maybe you wrote down something like, he cares for me. He's caring towards me. As you think of that passage in First Peter, right, about casting all your cares and anxieties upon him because he cares for you. you know, that's what I think God thinks about me. He, he's caring towards me. He cares for me. Whatever word or words that you wrote down, whether positive or negative, or maybe a blend of both, as is probably the case for many of us, I think there's, there's one word that stands out above the rest, and that really kind of encapsulates all the positive words into one word. And that word is this. It's the word love. The word love. That when God thinks about you, when he sees you, knowing you fully, mistakes and all, he does not look at you with anger or disappointment or ambivalence, but he looks at you in love. He says, that's my boy. 
That's my girl. I love him. I love her because God loves you. And his disposition towards you has always been and always, always will be one of love. It's so basic, isn't it? This is stuff we teach our kids in Sunday school. If you're a parent, it's stuff that you teach your kids growing up about God. That he, he loves you. Jesus loves you. God loves you. And yet we forget it. Don't we? The older we grow in our faith, the bigger our questions become, the bigger our struggles become, the more complicated our life becomes. We forget this very simple truth. That God loves us. Exactly as we are and not as we should be. Because none of us are as we are. I think this is one of the most important things you could ever understand about God and about you. That God loves you. You see this so clearly in John 3.16. Look at the language that Jesus uses. We're quoting Jesus, by the way, when we quote John 3.16. These are his words. Look at how Jesus talks about God's love here. He says, for God so loved the world. So loved. Not not so liked (laughs) or was just kind of fond of. Or, or kind of felt mid towards the world, as my kids would say. Everything's mid. And you're like, what? You don't have teenagers. You've got to figure this stuff out. You'll figure it out. But no, it's still God. God so loves the world. That's how he felt about you and about me. God so loved. This word love being the Greek word agape, one of the four loves that the New Testament uses to describe God's love. It's the highest form of love mentioned in the Bible, describing God's selfless, sacrificial, and unconditional love for you and for me. That's the kind of love he had for us. Not just a feeling or an emotion, the warm fuzzies. It's not like God's up in heaven like, oh, look at how cute they are. And, oh, they just make me feel so. Our kids, when they see our dog, Oreo, they love Oreo. Many of you have met Oreo. They just squeal with excitement. They get that tingly feeling up their back. That's not necessarily the kind of love I don't think that God has for us, a squealing kind of love, like the love that my kids have for their dog. No, it's a deeper kind of love. It's not a warm and fuzzy kind of love, but agape love. God's sacrificial love, unconditional love. But then he also, Jesus says here, not just loved us, but he so loved the world. That word so, speaking to the intensity of God's agape love for us, that he so loved that he gave what ultimately his love led him to do, wasn't it? Not, not just to feel some things for us, but ultimately it led him to action, where because God so loved the world, Jesus tells us that he gave his one and only son, his most precious gift. That's what he gave us. He gave us himself, God in the flesh, love in the flesh, that because God was so torn apart by what he was seeing, sin and death, and evil doing to the people, to creation, to the world that he so loved, that he said, enough is enough. And he sent us his very best. He sent us Jesus, God in the flesh, love in the flesh, to deal with our sin problem once and for all. This, according to John 3.16 and several other passages in the pages of Scripture, is what we see God feeling about us when he feels things towards us. This is what God thinks about when God thinks about you. He loves you. He loves you. Even, especially, in your failures, in your mistakes, in your weaknesses, in your doubts, and your questions. Not when you're doing really well in life and you're succeeding and you feel like you're you're winning and you're you're doing well at pleasing God and reading your Bible a lot and praying a lot and going to church a lot and doing all the good. No, He loves you in your worst moments, the same as He loves you in your best. That's the kind of love He has for us. It's crazy. For me, I, I got to tell you, the, the longer that I follow Jesus and the longer I study the Scriptures and consider what it is to be a Christian, the, the more I am coming to realize that. Much of the Christian life is simply about coming to terms with this very reality. That God loves me. Exactly as I am. And I have nothing to prove to anybody because of that. I can't earn it by being really good. I can't unearn it by being really bad. I I can't do anything to make him love me any more 
or any less than he already does because he loves me fully because of what Jesus has done for me. Brendan Manning, who's an author of a book called The Ragamuffin Gospel, which is a book, spoiler alert, for Matt and Sarah, whatever they are, that I'm going to be giving to them. I give it to everybody who gets baptized. It's one of the, the one of my favorite books. It, it, it really helped shape and form me years ago in my faith journey. He has a, a quote that I, I love. It kind of summarizes it when he says it like this. My deepest awareness of myself is that I am deeply loved by Jesus Christ, and I have done nothing to earn it or deserve it. That's a profound statement. My deepest awareness of myself is that I am deeply loved by Jesus Christ, and I have done nothing to earn it or deserve it. Kim's Oma um, passed away four years ago in December. And a uh, Dutch woman who came over from Holland in, I think, her late 30s or so and um, didn't speak English very well, obviously learned the language as she lived here, but a uh, real, real strong Dutch woman passed away at 97 years old four years ago. I had the privilege of doing her funeral. As a side note, I made a joke. I've told some of you this story about how when I was doing the funeral, it was a privilege to do the funeral, I made a joke about how she was one of the first women, first people I ever met who got my last name right at the very first t- try. Yancey. Because, of course, it's like a silent J or whatever, right? However you describe that. She'd say my last name right. But she could never say my first name right. She'd always call me Yes. Yes, Yancey. It's been four years. You know my children call me to this day? Yes. Some of you have heard this in church when I'm talking, and they'll be like, yeah, if I'm going with mom or I'm doing this, and I'll respond to it because I gave up saying, no, it's dad or daddy, that's it. I just now respond to yes. But Kim Soma, she was a beautiful woman, Petronella was her name now. Towards the end of her life, as her mind was failing her, it was really interesting how, for her, she would go back to songs, children's songs that she learned when she was younger, or she sang with her kids when they were younger. She started to forget things and, you know, struggle in her health and things like this. We'd meet with her, and sometimes she'd just break out singing, Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, for they are weak, but he is strong. I would sing it for you, but I would scar you for life. You know how the song goes. <laughs> We could just go back to that simple song and that simple truth, you know, like when life got complicated, health was failing, or nothing else mattered but knowing that simple truth. Jesus loves me. This I know. It's true for us. We forget that in the chaos of this life. Jesus loves you. This we know. For the Bible tells us so. I want to share real quick just three reflections about Jesus' love. God's love for you and for me before we go to the Lord's table together. First reflection is this. This is so important. God's love for you is not dependent on you. It's a weird thing to say, isn't it? God's love for you is not dependent on you or your performance or your theology or your beliefs or your behavior or how holy you are or how holy you aren't. It has nothing to do with you and your ability to earn God's love or unearn God's love, because God's love for you is not dependent on you. His love for you is unconditional. That's what the word agape love speaks to you. God's unconditional love for us, and that there's nothing that we can do to make him love us any more or any less than he already does. We see this so clearly in John 3.16, don't we? That God's love for the world actually had nothing to do with the world's performance or behavior or actions or ability to earn God's love. The, the verse does not say, for example, that the world tried really hard to impress God and to earn God's love. And so finally God gave in. And he said, okay, fine. I'll love them by sending them to Jesus. That's not how the verse reads, does it? It has nothing to do with the, the world and what the world did, what we did. Instead, this verse is for God, who is love, by the way, and can't help but to share his love and extend his love to us. First John 4, verse 8 describes God that way. God is being loved. For God, who is love, so loved the world that he sent us Jesus. That first Christmas. That whoever believes in him, which doesn't just mean like intellectually we acknowledge that he existed and that he was God in the flesh. It speaks to a trust. Like we're placing our, our faith and our hope and our trust in him to save us, not ourselves. Whoever believes in him will not perish 
but we'll have eternal life. And we'll get to live forever in the reality of His never-ending love. Because God's love for us in Christ is unconditional and has nothing to do with our ability to earn it or unearn it. Do you believe that? Like, I think theologically we get that, but do you believe that? Brendan Manning, the same author, he put it like this in his memoirs, All His Grace. He says, God loves you unconditionally, as you are and not as you should be, because nobody is as they should be. Isn't that amazing? There's no limit to his love. It's hard for us to understand the unconditional love of God, I think, because this just isn't how most life relationships work, (laughs) isn't it? There are often limits to God's, or to people's love for one another, isn't there? If you've ever experienced a bad breakup or divorce after standing at the altar and saying those vows and thinking that you're entering into a covenant relationship, unconditional love forever for each other, only to have them walk away, that's disappointing. Have you ever been abandoned by a parent or by a sibling or by a friend who you thought was going to be there, or you've ever been abused by someone that you trusted. You know what I'm talking about. You ever experienced betrayal by a close friend or even church people, <laughs> people that you trusted. You know what I'm talking about. As, as imperfect human beings, we love imperfectly. And so it could be hard to believe that God could ever love us perfectly or unconditionally. Because we so rarely experience that kind of love in this life. The closest thing, I think, that we have to this, that gives us just a glimpse of God's perfect love for us, is the imperfect love of a parent. (laughs) I don't know if you see, there will be a picture here on the screen that you're going to make fun of me for. Ah, there we are. Yes, Jeff with hair (laughs) and in a Blue Jays cap and earrings. Oh, what was I thinking? <laughs> oh, my goodness. But I remember, uh, this is Brendan, by the way, 16 plus years ago. I forgot to warn you, Brendan, that you're going to be on the screen this morning. So sorry about that. But isn't he a cute little baby? Isn't he just so cute? Make that little ooh and ah type stuff that my kids do with the dog we did with our babies, right? But I remember holding all three of our, our kids, all three of our babies in the hospital for the very first time, right after they were born. And I remember thinking in that moment as I looked at them and held them that I just, I didn't think it was possible to love them any more than I did in that moment. How many of you parents know what I'm talking about, right? Now, what had my kids done in that moment to earn that love? Nothing. In fact, Brendan had just about destroyed my wife who gave birth to him and who carried him for nine months. If anything, I should have been angry at him. Like, what, what did you do to my wife? Why would you do such a thing, Right? If anything, he'd done the opposite in earning my love. He earned my, my wrath, my anger. But I loved him completely. Because my love for him, my love for my kids, actually was not dependent at all on their ability to earn my love. It was simply because of the fact that they are mine. And I love them exactly for who they were no matter what. You know, and then as they've grown, and I remember one of the first times Brendan got sick as a toddler or whatever, and he had a fever, high fever. And I remember he's like, oh, what do we do? You know, as a, as a first-time parent, you kind of panic. Like, well, you know, do we go to the ER? How do we deal with all this kind of stuff? And I just remember praying when Brendan was sick. Like, God, could you just take this away from him and give it to me? If I could take this from him, I would do it in a second. I'd, I'd way rather be the one on, you know, laid out on the couch or in bed with a 104 degree fever and packing up a lung than this little guy. Because that's the kind of love that parents, parents who are starving to be good parents, have for their kids, imperfect as it is. It gives us just, I think, a little bit of a glimpse into how God sees you and me. He loves us unconditionally, and His love for us is not dependent on us at all or our ability to earn it or unearn it. It's dependent on Him with who He is. So, do you know the unconditional, unearned, unchanging love of God for you? Ultimately, what the Christmas story is all about, love came down for you. 
me for us. That's reflection number one. Last two will be quick. Second reflection is this. God's love for you transforms you. God's love for you transforms you. We put so much pressure on ourselves to change ourselves sometimes, don't we? And we've got to change our character. We've got to change our behavior. We've got to do better. We've got to be better. Of course, we all want to do better. And we all want to be. There's a whole section of books. If you go to Indigo, self-help books. It's a billion-dollar industry, multi-billion-dollar industry. Self-help books that teach you, show you how to be a better version of yourself. We put so much pressure on ourselves to be better and do better. And yet, the reality is, while it's good to try and it's good to, you know, some of those books have good tips and things that can help us improve in different ways. At the end of the day, we can't fix ourselves completely. We can't change our character fully apart from knowing and embracing the love of God. John picked up on this very idea in one of his letters. He wrote John, John 3, 16. He also wrote 1 John. We're in 1 John 4, verses 18 to 19. He talks about this. He says, Such love, which is God's agape love, has no fear, because perfect love expels all fear. All fear. Fear of failure, fear of what other people think about us, fear of not turning out the way that we think we should turn out, fear of punishment, as John talks about here, fear of all sorts of kinds. He says, if we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment, and this shows that we have not fully experienced God's perfect love. Remember there's insecurity living inside of us. shows that we've not let, we've not let God's love break through. Remember there's shame, anger, bitterness, all that stuff that is rooted in fear just shows us where we have not yet experienced God's perfect love. And then verse 19, look what he says. He says, we love each other because he first loved us. That's how we love. Because God's love transforms us. When we know that we're loved by God, we can't help but share that love with others. You want to love your kids more, your parent? You want to love your spouse more, your married? You want to love your parents more, your neighbors, your co-workers, one another? So just try harder Consider God's incredible, perfect love for you. And more than that, ask God to reveal His love to you, and maybe fill you with His love, because God's love transforms us. We're going to celebrate that transformation that's happening in Matt and Sarah in just a little bit. God's love is transforming them and making them more like Jesus each and every day. Last reflection, and most important reflection is this, before we come to the Lord's table. It's that God's love for you was fully revealed in Christ on the cross. God's love for you is fully revealed in Christ on the cross. You'll never see see a more clear picture of God's love for the world than Jesus Christ hanging on the cross, dying for the sins of the world, dying for his enemies, dying for those who nailed those nails into his hands. Whatever you want to know what God's love for you looks like, again, it's not just warm fuzzies, it's not the tingles, it's not just an emotion, it's an action. If you want to know what God's love for you looks like? Look to the cross. Look to the cross. First John 4, verses 9 through 10 says this, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son, Jesus, into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. Does that sound familiar? Sounds like John 3.16 a little bit, doesn't it? This is John paraphrasing it or rephrasing it here in his other letter, 1 John. Verse 10. This is real love. Not that we love God, because who are we? We can't love God in and of ourselves. We're broken, flawed people. It's not about us. It's not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. You know how I mentioned earlier about how I just wished that when... Brendan was sick as a little kid. I could, I could take his sickness upon myself. I couldn't. Who can? That's what God did for you and for me through Jesus. He looked at you and he looked at me and he saw what sin was doing to you and he said, I wish I could just take all that off of them and put it on myself. Because I can handle it. They can't, but I can. And so that's what he did. Because he is the perfect parent. And his love is perfect towards us. He took upon himself the sins of the world, our sins, your sins. 
so that we could be set free from it, so that we could be healed and made whole in every way. It's incredible love. We don't know a love like this apart from God, do we? We can't know a love like this. There is no love like this. It's reflection number three. God's love for you fully revealed in Christ on the cross. In just a moment, we are going to remember Christ on the cross in just a, a very tactile, practice kind of way by coming to the table, taking the bread, taking the juice, which symbolizes the death of Christ for us. But before we do that, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians uh, 11 talks about how it's important that we examine ourselves before we come to the Lord's table. We want to take a moment to do that. And the way that I want to invite you to examine yourself this morning is to open up that notebook that you opened earlier with your word. What do you think about, or what do you think God thinks about when God thinks about you? Or if you didn't write down a note, maybe you didn't, the back of your mind, bring those words to mind. Let's take a look at those words. How does God feel about you? I want you to look at the word that you wrote and just ask God, why, why do I think this for a moment? What, what is it about my story, about my life that makes me think this way about you? Good or bad, whatever. Why do I think this? And then ask God to give you the ability to replace that word with the word love. Show me your love. Ask him to show you his love. Take a moment to do that. Look at your word. See where love fits into that story. Let's do that as we examine ourselves before coming to the Lord's table. Lord Jesus, this morning, we want to know and experience your love for us. Not because we're self-centered people who need you to show us about, you know, how it's all about us or something like this. No. We want to experience your love because we know that you are love and that you can't help but love. And that because perfect love casts out all fear, because perfect love transforms us, because the love that you showed for us on the cross saves us, makes us new, you desire for us to experience that. So we ask that you show us your love for us. And as we consider your love, we look to the cross and remember that there is no greater love than this than when a friend lays down his life for his friends. And because of Jesus, we are now God's friends. We've been invited in. There is no greater love than that. And you would empower us to walk in that love, to give it away freely to those who don't deserve it, because we don't deserve it. To forgive, to show grace towards, to be filled with your love, so filled up with your love that we can't help but give it away. But God, we need to know your love first in a deep and profound way. We pray that you reveal that to us this morning.